Good morning. Uh, this is Steve Thompson with Applied Engineering. I'm here with Mike, Mark Wolski, the Chief Operating Officer for Impact Dakota. Um, I'm going to speak for just a minute or two and kind of introduce a little bit on the webinar and then also a little bit about Impact Dakota and Applied. And then we'll get right into the, the, the reason you're all here is to get the value out of the, the presentation. Um, first of all, thank you for attending. Um, we put on these Applied Day seminars to try to add value to our, our customers and our partners. We're not trying to peddle a bunch of items or anything. We're just trying to add value to help everybody out. Um, it's just, and part of that value add is we've partnered up. I don't know if you saw the, the emails that have gone out, <coughs> excuse me, for uh, the Impact Dakota and Applied Partnership. Um, but Impact Dakota is uh, part of North Dakota's Manufacturing Extension Program. Excuse me, I had a little frog in my throat. Um, and that's a private public partnership in all 50 states. Um, and it works with small and medium sized manufacturers for their, to enhance their growth and uh, profitability. And North Dakota's, uh, Mark is a part of the North Dakota <coughs> uh, chapter of that. Um, he's, uh, since 2003, Mark's been assisting companies in a wide variety of industries to increase profits and create and retain jobs. His em emphasis is on leading high performance teams and facilitating design, development, and implementation of continuous improvement and growth strategies on an enterprise wide basis. Uh, prior to joining Impact Dakota, is a principal engineer at Steelcase uh, at the Fortune 500 company in Grand Rapids, Michigan, holding leadership positions in business systems, R&D, new product development, manufacturing, and he is a Bison, and he received his uh, BS in industrial engineering management from NDSU. Um, Mark is a valued asset um, for us to be able to have him come in and visit with us today. Uh, it's great to have him here. And then just also, you know, uh, just get back to Applied and Impact Dakota have teamed up to try to work with um, our customers and uh, their customers to try to bring um, a little more uh, visibility and vision to opportunities that are out there to do that grow business and um, impact profitability. So we can talk about that at a later time. Um, otherwise, you can email myself or Mark. Um, to learn more about that. And we did have a, uh, you may have seen a press release that went out yesterday regarding that on the email. But without further ado, I will pass this over to Mark. Um, there is a, just a quick reminder at the end of the, the presentation or webinar, uh, there'll be a quick survey. I think it's only like three questions or something. Uh, please take the time to fill that out. Um, we appreciate your feedback to see what we can do better. Um, what works, what doesn't, um, and so each year uh, we can continue to add value and uh, bring everyone's time is important, so we want to make sure we're, we're getting the most out of that. So I will pass it over to Mark, and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in. We'll get to them at the end, um, and so without further ado, here you go, Mark. All right. Thanks, Steve. And thanks to uh, Applied Engineering for the opportunity to present. Oh, okay. Gee, I'm giving a presentation on technology and uh, I don't know quite how to use a mouse here. So. <laughs> uh, just real quickly go over the uh, topic that we're going to cover and, you know, what is it? industrial internet of things and again uh, this is uh, geared towards uh, a lot of times the manufacturers themselves and so when they start hearing a lot of the terminology which we'll, we'll take a look at here you know they're a little confused so um, we look at it from a phased approach uh, first of all starting out with you know establishing clear targets from your strategic planning basically it's uh, it's not a strategy where, well, the latest and greatest technology is out, like the iPhone, or we're in a camp outside the store overnight. Uh, this is something that uh, really emphasizing that there is a there a business case uh, based on your uh, 
the, the organization's goals and objectives. Uh, to do that, we're going to look at identifying the key processes. KPIs are critical. Uh, determining uh, the data collection, which there's a lot of, and how we communicate that, that's going to be very important. We'll cover that. And then, uh, again, it's a phased approach. So how do we leverage the equipment and systems that we already have? Uh, the, the phase two strategy, again, is uh, just growing into uh, this new technology and what immediate applications can our clients take advantage of right now. And then we'll show you some examples uh, nationally and also ones that we've uh, come across. So getting back into it, um, if you look at the, uh, the orange text, that's really the, the key points. Uh, the industrial uh, Internet of Things, you know, we're looking at uh, the, these brilliant machines and advanced analytics uh, combined with people at work and uh, in networked communications, the technologies that go along with it, uh, monitoring, collecting, exchanging, and analyzing uh, just so we can get a smarter and faster uh, business decisions. I just realized this. Screen's not on, so now it should look better. Yep, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, you know, what is the, what's the benefit, you know, the hype that's going on right now? Obviously, uh, people have read articles that uh, technology's coming. Well, you know, it, it's already here. It's just a matter of, uh, again, incorporating it uh, into your business uh, strategically and systematically. Uh, McKinsey study, uh, global study, uh, came out with uh, economic impacts between 4 trillion and 11 trillion by 2025. Uh, I think the only thing that's probably gonna kind of put the brakes on a little bit and maybe add a little sanity to the uh, uh, implementation is the fact that the technology is evolving so quickly uh, faster than anybody could actually implement it. And then uh, the need for integrators, uh, there's a, a shortage of those folks. So that, that might be a good thing. So here's some of the terminology. What I'd like to focus on here when we talk about our partnership uh, between Impact Dakota and uh, Applied is uh, uh, where we can uh, complement each other is that the machine to, to machine uh, interfaces, the computer integrated manufacturing and the human and machine interface, uh, which we'll be talking about. And of course, uh, there's a lot more to it. So let's take a look at some of these things. Uh, since 2014, um, you know, a lot of companies have, have already invested in digitalization and they're the larger organizations, uh, some small ones, but uh, for the most part, it's been, you know, we've got to do this, and unfortunately, uh, less than 25% of those businesses have actually achieved top-line growth as a result, and we're going to kind of talk about why that is. Yes, there we go. So, again, is automation itself the objective, or is it a business case that we're looking at? Um, and sometimes it's... Uh, it's kind of a mix of, of both, but it's not real clear on what we're trying to accomplish with technology, which is going to make implementation itself a challenge. And it could be a lot of money wasted in uh, automating things that, oops, sorry, that don't need to be automated. Let's see if I can move forward here. So kind of a, huh, there we go. If you look at it from three different perspectives, uh, a lot of what Impact Dakota does is we are into continuous improvement of uh, processes, uh, and whatever those tools are, uh, we, we let the, the, the process itself point to those. And one of the cautions we look at is uh, if you have a lot of significant waste, and we look at waste of those things that uh, the customer's not really willing to pay for, it just adds cost to your organization. Um, if there's a lot of, of it present, automating that will result in generating waste much faster. And I'll give you one example that we came across when we were uh, in this uh, recent project uh, where a, a company um, 
uh, we determined that their bottleneck or constraint was in their final assembly area. And one of the components of that cycle time is a significant one was uh, hand cleaning of these products, it's uh, cabinet work. And the, the cleaning was a result of upstream automation projects, uh, basic or uh, processes uh, such as uh, conveyor belts um, that are being driven on uh, aluminum pulleys that were wearing and leaving aluminum dust all over the the product itself, and it took up to 10 minutes, well, even more, on every one of these units uh, to clean that off, and this has been going on for ages, and I guess they just kind of accepted it as that's the, the price of, uh, of doing business this way. And so they were actually looking at automating uh, the process, the automating the cleaning process. And then we came in and we basically said, let's kind of do a little root cause analysis, track down the reason for uh, these uh, belt marks, and we were able to eliminate them and uh, save them a ton of money because they didn't have to in, uh, automate something that was just pure waste. So. If we look at uh, process automation resulting from technology alone, on average, this is from the McKinsey, recent McKinsey Global Study, was uh, you're looking at a 2% productivity gain on average, and process improvements prior to automation yields 8% on average in productivity gains. But when done together, where you do the process improvements first and then automate, in other words, get rid of waste, um, they uh, saw yields of 20% in productivity gains. So, uh, you know, a lot of it is, you know, let's just automate everything. Uh, but we have to look at those processes, and a lot of them, because we've got legacy uh, processes, paperwork, reports, things like that, uh, that if you ask, why are you still doing this, and nobody can come up with a good reason, it's just that we've always done it this way. Um, these are things that don't need to be automated, uh, you know, paraphrase uh, Peter Drucker, um, there's nothing so useless as doing efficiently or automating that which should not be done at all. So there's a key point and probably one of the primary themes here. Excuse me. Okay. So starting out, again, establish that business case and then uh, if you have a business case, obviously there's goals and objectives, profitability, cash flow, whatever. Uh, quality rates. Um, those KPIs or key performance indicators need to be tracked and probably one of the greatest advantages that you achieve through automation that you can uh, actually uh, achieve fairly quickly is we call it managing in real time. In other words, get that um, those key measures displayed for uh, both the operators and leadership so that uh, decisions can be made in real time as problems occur, um, not at the at the end of the month when a report is published. So that's going to be a huge benefit when it comes to uh, automation of those things that they can actually do fairly quickly. As for KPIs, uh, we don't want to measure everything. Again, we're, we're comparing uh, these uh, performance metrics to our uh, lagging indicators, which are our, uh, our business results and a KPI is you know above all else it's a set of indicators that best reflect progress towards those stated goals and objectives some key points about that and we've seen varying levels of, of uh, how these measures are displayed in or not displayed and how they're used but you can't manage what you don't measure, and that's a key point when it comes to automation. Um, incident displays of measures are instantly actionable, and I guess that's if you're looking at a sports metaphor uh, with the, at a, at a uh, football or, or a basketball game, you've got the clock, you've got the scores, you've got the coach right there on the, on the uh, floor with the players, and as things progress, uh, you're making uh, instant real-time decisions to keep you in the game to the end, and it's amazing how many organizations do not operate that way. So if you're looking at these two pictures over here, um, we talk about managing in real time, and if you are responsible for performance in a manufacturing setting or any setting, 
which one of these would you actually prefer? Where you can basically just kind of step out of your office and glance around and know instantly, at a glance, uh, what the status is and uh, react to it in that same time. You don't have to wait. In fact, we encourage uh, these uh, manufacturers to get out there and start doing uh, real-time displays of data. It seems just on a, a whiteboard or a chalkboard to kind of uh, tweak it, uh, get it to working the way they want it to, and then go ahead and uh, add the uh, the sensors that will and the displays that display that same data. And we call this uh, small data. And what that is, that's real-time actionable data. It's telling you what's happening in real time uh, as things happen. Once that is in place, then we say, well, rather than scrapping all your equipment and starting out with all brand new automation, uh, leverage the equipment that you have. You can go ahead and add sensors uh, to a lot of your existing equipment. And again, as long as you know what those KPIs are for that equipment, you can again incorporate the real-time displays of data and, and be able to make real-time decisions again based on, on that data. And then as you start incorporating, as the business case indicates, you start incorporating in new equipment. That's when, now that you've had some uh, practice and, uh, with uh, these real-time displays, uh, we wanna make sure that the new equipment has uh, these integrated dashboards and a lot of the equipment nowadays will actually uh, diagnose uh, itself um, so that you can track things like uh, downtime by category. So a lot of benefits. I just want to jump back to uh, data real quickly. Uh, there's small and big data when we talk about capturing this and there is gonna be a lot of data. We don't wanna put a lot of emphasis on the big data right now because uh, that's something that's where we're crunching the numbers. We're looking at trends, correlations, relationships, all those type of things. Uh, but you can capture the small data now, and, and it, you are encouraged at this point to just start capturing it, and we'll worry about what we do with it later. So when you are sure and you tweak things, that you're measuring the right things, uh, cost, quality, delivery, then um, we're looking at... Um, how can we tweak that again before we actually in, uh, jump in real big into the automation pool and start investing our big bucks? We know we're doing the right things. And of course, when we get into that now, I always seem to want to jump two slides ahead here. Let's see here. Maybe it's telling me you need to move faster, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's okay. Um, I'm going to provide some examples right now uh, that we've come across. Uh, this one, for example, when we talk about uh, the Internet of Things, um, interconnectability of equipment, talking to each other, learning machines, things like that. This is all here today. And one example that we come across, this was in a die casting operation, where a uh, signal is sent from an upstream process to the die casting press to preheat the die, which in the past was a 20 minute delay as part of their setup. Uh, now that's done because the machine knows uh, the aluminum's coming and that's done in advance uh, to take uh, a huge amount of that uh, setup time out. And then the machine is actually learning. It's looking at which die temperatures and, and uh, the temperature and time combination provide the the best uh, quality characteristics for the part. And again, that gets into the, the big data. Move this slowly here. That seems to be locked for some reason. Okay, this, yeah, this is good now, thank you. I want to bring up another thing, and this is something that, again, getting back to uh, our, our partnership, is that uh, one of our, our, uh, our, our parent organization at the federal level is the National Institute of Standards Technology. And I'll show you a, a few uh, frames, photos from their labs, their technology labs, 
But what's happening right now here in the Dakotas um, that we're going to be getting into shortly here and we want to uh, work with uh, applied on that is we're going to be uh, bringing in uh, collaborative robots uh, or cobots, uh, which are designed to work right next to a human being. Uh, they have all the safety features. They don't need fences, and uh, uh, it's they're they're meant for uh, re highly repetitive jobs. Uh, a lot of times, uh, jobs that uh, uh, human uh, uh, employees don't want to do anyway. It's kind of that mindless work or it could be in a maybe more of an environmentally unsafe uh, condition. Um, we are looking at being able to take these around to our potential clients to mitigate their risk when it comes to uh, buying these things and put them into production, uh, program them quickly and get them going so that they can evaluate them and then they can make a more informed decision on whether to proceed with that. So those are here today too. Uh, this is some uh, screen captures from a video from, again, our parents of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, one of their technology labs, uh, that anybody is uh, invited to come and uh, observe. They can actually even take some of their own products and have them tested out. Um, so you can see where we have a, a number of uh, collaborative robots in place it's actually there's no humans involved in this uh, production at all. Uh, they're simple, it's pick and place and simple assembly. Um, these robots, uh, you can you can build on them, you can add vision systems, uh, uh, mobility. Uh, they will actually pass uh, transfer uh, parts from one another. Handoffs and Here's another example. If anybody gets uh, uh, is out in the Chicago area, this is a uh, you know you kind of look at it as kind of a factory of the future, but it's a working factory. It's if anybody's aware of this, it's this Trump Smart Factory in Chicago, and what they have is it is a working factory that uh, they have customers and. Because their changeovers are basically uh, they're immediate. Um, they're pricing whether you order one part or a thousand, it's the same per part price, which is a, a big departure from way how, from how most manufacturers do business. All material is moved by uh, conveyors and intelligent guided vehicles that work on internal GPS rather than satellite. Their sensors in the ceiling. Uh, telling them where to go. Um, uh, they're all machine-to-machine uh, -machine interfaces. There are no operators, just some uh, maintenance workers and uh, technicians. Uh, they have smart maintenance where um, the, the, the designers of this equipment are in Germany. This is in Chicago. And if a, a piece of machinery goes down, they simply put on a pair of goggles and press a button while looking at a barcode that's on the machine. And then by proxy, basically uh, the uh, maintenance uh, technician or engineer in Germany will kind of use your body <laughs> to fix the machine. So big benefits there when it comes to travel. Another example, again, the Internet of Things that's in place right now, Siemens, uh, their gas turbines, over 500 sensors that continuously monitor uh, operating characteristics, um, and it learns and it makes adjustments on the fly. The machine does itself through artificial intelligence, and it was able to reduce emissions by uh, 10 to 15 percent over and above uh, what they had going on right now. If I was to look at some examples again um, that look like will be coming here locally is uh, working with a uh, company that their rock, uh, raw material is stored in bins like grain bins and the, uh, the, the old technology um, when it came time to uh, look at how full the bins are and when they should reorder product is they would go out and uh, throw golf balls 
at the sides of the uh, the bins, and they get an idea by the sound of how much they have left, and then they'd uh, make a decision whether to order it uh, or not. And we have discussions going on with them right now where we can put sensors uh, in their grain bins, and they're movable up and down so that as uh, demand uh, changes, they can uh, they can change that height. And what it does is that the, when the the grain gets down to a certain point, the grain bin itself uh, will send an order to the supplier uh, based on uh, the, the quantity left will be based on uh, the lead time of the supplier getting another truck to reload those bins. So uh, again, it's all here. And uh, again, from the, the partnership point of view, what we look at is uh, process improvements. And there's whether it's manual or automated and at what level of automation we're looking at, we, uh, as a uh, manufacturing extension partnership, um, would be looking at taking them to the point where we identify uh, the need and the potential benefits. And then we would be looking at probably having some technical support uh, to help carry through with the implementation, software, uh, connectivity, and things like that. So, well, got done a little bit quicker than uh, I thought. So, are there any questions? If you have any questions, you can just shoot them in on the, <clears throat> on, uh, the text. It looks like there's a couple here. Well, we start with uh, uh, what? Uh, what are the biggest obstacles to implementing the Internet of Things? Well, I think that's just it, is that we don't know. We don't know. The Internet of Things is such a broad topic. Um, again, you just don't jump into it. And I think uh, our charter is small to medium-sized manufacturers. And um, they're reluctant to jump in because it is a huge investment. And you can imagine if... Um, you jump in, you make an investment, <clears throat> and it doesn't give you the results that you want. That's a sunk cost, and it's uh, recouping that is going to be uh, very difficult. So I think most companies are going to proceed very, very cautiously, and I think it gives them a level of confidence to have uh, some outside assistance uh, to guide them you know, through uh, Impact Coder and or Applied Technology. All right. How about uh, not all of my equipment is capable of monitoring? Uh, there's some other solutions of, or maybe equipment that isn't, you know, a lot of people have equipment that's out on the floor that's, you know, maybe wired like old telephone line or whatever else. Or is there some options there for getting sensors where they typically haven't been in the past? Oh, absolutely, and it's very situation specific. Um, you can apply sensors that are out there right now, uh, just about anything now. The communications, obviously, that's uh, I think that's fairly straightforward. I think you know, there's wireless and wired, uh, just depends on how you want to approach it. But yes, uh, you can take uh, existing equipment and you can add uh, sensors to it, and those sensors will, depending on what your needs are, and that's why it's good to looking at. Uh, both your KPIs and your uh, key operating characteristics, you know, temperature, pressure, uh, what have you, um, what what do you want to measure? And then uh, that can be captured and communicated right now. All right. Um, there's a question. Uh, does it help to approach the process improvement first with a lean Six Sigma I, and then move into the industrial IoT. I think you mentioned a little bit about that, Mark, but maybe you could span in. So, what's the what specific lean KPIs are important? That's a great question. That leads into another question we had too: is what's the best way to start with IoT or industrial Internet of Things or whatever uh, buzzword you want to use? But what's the best way to start the process? Yeah, and there's no doubt about it that, and that's been one of the primary themes uh, of this presentation and, and of what we do is, um, again, being so careful to, uh, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out. 
is basically uh, clean up your your processes when they're in their, uh, their their current state before you automate, just to make sure that you aren't automating things that don't need to be done at all. Uh, that's what we're looking for. And whatever uh, continuous improvement, process improvement uh, program, whether it be uh, uh, Lean or Six Sigma or you know Lean Six Sigma, uh, absolutely the answer is uh, you know, unequivocal yes, that that should be done uh, in advance. Anyway, that's just, uh, it's just eliminating waste. And then, uh, you know, automation is just another uh, set of tools, another approach to uh, fulfilling your, uh, satisfying your business case. Yeah, one, one thing, thanks, Mark. And, and we were, uh, a few of us were out at the Impact Dakota Conference up in Bismarck a couple of weeks ago and uh, sat on some great, great uh, seminars there. And one thing was is that one thing that Impact Dakota really specializes in, and one of the reasons we partnered with them is because they have some great expertise and they can help adjust to the philosophy of lean, Six Sigma, uh, process improvement. And looking at <clears throat> that from a manufacturing industrial engineering kind of aspect, so you can make those big steps there and then work toward automation after that. Um, I can't I can't say that enough that it's it, you need to take a step back before automation and Internet of Things to figure out what what it, uh, what you actually should be doing and looking at value add non value add type situations and seeing if there's anything you can clean up and sometimes cleaning that up makes it the whole automation process much much easier because there's not a lot of extra steps that could be tweaked up front. Um, so it's just, it's a, it's kind of a philosophy um, and Impact Dakota is a great, great source for that to help engage that philosophy and move it into practice and uh, applied is also, um, but I just want to, I want to say that that's one thing that I've taken away from working with Impact is, is just the whole mindset of uh, refining what you currently do and just taking a step back at, at a high level, start digging in and uh, figuring out what's, what do we really need to be doing? Uh, how can we improve what we currently do? Because um, everybody knows that there's not enough resources to do um, what we need to do a lot of times. There's, you know, short on hard to get help. Um, everyone's busy. Um, job market's tough. Um, and so finding good people, if we can really take advantage of those resources and optimize the time they're there and only doing value added type situations um, to improve the product rather than uh, non-value add of transport or turning or adding things that aren't necessarily adding to the product at the end state um, is, is a very good situation. Yeah, and I think Steve, that brings up a good point about the, the job market. Um, out here, you, you probably read some articles about uh, how uh, people are going to be displaced with, with automation, and uh, you know, down the down the road, you know, we look at that trunk factory where there are no operators whatsoever. However, there are uh, quite a few people in the background uh, with the technical expertise to keep that place up and running. But that that's the extreme. Let's face it: in uh, this region, there aren't going to be too many companies that are going to jump to that level. No. Uh, right off the bat, so it, that's more of a uh, it, it's a working factor, but it's more of a, a marketing uh, effort on their part. But that is a huge boon to this area because when we talk to our clients, probably uh, we ask, you know, what what's keeping you up at night? What's your what's your 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 biggest issue? And they say, you know, what everybody else says, we can't find people. And as we mentioned, um, like with these uh, collaborative robots and some of this other automation, um, it's not going to displace people. It's going to fit into places where we can't find people. And it's, uh, again, a lot of it right now is this uh, uh, kind of mindless, repetitive work that a uh, robot or cobot could do very easily and accurately that, uh, again, the, the humans don't want to do anyway. So it frees up time for them to do a bit more uh, uh, work that where they can actually apply their their brain power rather than just their back. Right, and I, I also think that um, I I look at the turning the uh, automation 
take displacing employees. Um, actually, I look at it the opposite way, and as being that without automation, there are going to be companies that just go away because they can't compete, they can't find the labor, and that I think is more damaging than automation. Um, because if you can't compete, um, you're not going to have any business, and if you don't have any business, you're not going to have any jobs. And so I look at it as more of automation is helping companies, especially around here, um, because the, you know, the, I talk to companies very, very regularly, and the biggest challenge they have is finding good, good people to work on the floor, and uh, and then reliable and, and things like that. So uh, we have another question: uh, How flexible are the cobots and high mix low volume assembly processes? Programmably, well, programmability and effect change in collision avoidance, etc. That is a great question because I know there's a lot of companies in this area that do uh, a lot of custom projects. And so, um, Mark, you want to handle that one? Yeah. It, it, in the high mix, low volume, obviously they are, uh, their advantage is in um, the, uh, the low mix, high volume, uh, where it's very repetitive type things. So I, all I can say in those cases is to actually, and that's why we're actually looking at acquiring some cobots to bring them in. Because there are certain things that even in a high mix, low volume, where you're going to have uh, repetitive, like loading machines. Uh, and just one a good example um, where they would uh, have a, a great advantage. Um, programmability is pretty much, uh, we, uh, it's very easy and very straightforward. Probably uh, rather than weeks, you're probably looking at hours or less. Uh, to program these things, <clears throat> excuse me, they are uh, uh, one gentleman from our South Dakota uh, MEP that came up uh, at our conference to demonstrate one of their cobots. Uh, I asked him, how did you learn about uh, programming this particular one? He said, I just went out to YouTube. It's just that straightforward. It's uh, just slightly uh, more uh, complicated than grabbing its arm and running it through the motions. Uh, there are a few uh, computer uh, display interfaces that you have to do, but otherwise it's it's very straightforward. You don't have to know a programming language. It's not like doing a PLC. Um, it's uh, very straightforward. And as far as the it says a collision avoidance things like that, the uh, uh, the safety part of it. And that's why they're called collaborative robots. Are meant to work right next to uh, humans. Uh, they don't need fences. It's not like the industrial robots that could uh, basically take your head off if they if you were in the wrong place. Uh, they are equipped with uh, radar, lidar, however you want to look at it. If they uh, come in uh, within a certain proximity, they, they, the arm just stops. Um, so all the safety features are built in, and they're not. Uh, if you're familiar with like the weld robots and the larger industrial robots where uh, it's big chunks of iron um, and moving at a rapid uh, speed. Uh, these are uh, tabletop, for the most part, uh, models. You can get uh, mobile ones that are uh, right around the size of a human being, one arm, two arm, uh, vision systems, all that type of thing that uh, if you did have a collision, it wouldn't be any more than if you had probably that if you had a collision with a human being. Um, so which we wouldn't want anyway. There's probably less chance with a cobot of that even happening. So they are uh, they are meant to work right next to a human. So and on that, that point, that's a, you know it wasn't in your more industrial like well hard fixtured industrial robots. Um, yeah, that the the low volume um, custom uh, market wasn't suitable for robots. But this yeah the new cobots that it's uh it's a very it's definitely worth digging into to find out areas where it could work um i know there are like mark was saying there are companies that advertise how easy they are to program um and so it's a it's a pretty exciting thing and if you look at it from i look at it from where is this technology why is it changing so fast well all you have to do is look at sensor technology uh, if you look at the advancements in um, 
autonomous driving cars, different things like that, those are driving these sensors. And those sensors then are being carried over to other markets for like cobots and things like that that are being able to uh, ride, if you will, on the coattails of other technology that's driving it. Um, so it's pretty amazing. Um, it's great stuff. Uh, and I, I would encourage you to, to follow up with uh, Mark or myself or Aaron um, with the, if you have any questions regarding, um, you know, cobots or industrial, looking at processes and just, just to dig in and have the conversations. Uh, we love to do that. That's one of the things we really enjoy is watching um, our customers and, and partners and stuff really advance. And uh, we like to help out where we can. Uh, with that, I think we'll wrap it up. Um, thanks again for attending the seminar or webinar. Um, and also there'll be, when you close out, there'll be a, a little survey. If you could, uh, um, if you could uh, fill that out, that would be great. Um, oh, a copy of the presentation. Yes, we can get that sent out also. And uh, we've got your email here, so we'll uh, we'll get that sent out. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the time. I know everyone's busy, um, and we'll talk soon. Thanks. Bye.